So erythromycin is a naturally occurring product used in homeopathic doses. Um, it comes from the, the genus of bacteria that gave us streptomycin. So that's been a very generous bug family. If you modify it slightly, you get azithromycin, and that's putting a nitrogen moiety up the top of the lactone ring. So sticking the nitrogen atom there makes it last longer, so uh, half-life of six weeks, and penetrate macrophages or, and be concentrated within cells. So it's a quite a useful addition um, to make a synthetic form of erythromycin. So macrolides are widely used in uh, quite different forms of obstructive lung diseases. Here I've listed who they work in and what benefits they give. So you can see diffuse panbronchiolitis, common or recognised commonly in Asia, but does occur in Australia. Cystic fibrosis and non-CF bronchiectasis. But they, they have an established place in these conditions. And the question now is, uh, are they going to be useful in asthma and COPD? And there's a, a little bit of reticence about uh, a positive answer to this question because of concern about antibiotic resistance and asthma and COPD are much more common. Uh, and so then, you know, is, is this, should we be going down this path for these com common diseases where there are other treatments? Um, I think the other thing is what benefits do they give to patients? And I think that's a really interesting thing because if you look at the list here, exacerbations is really where the benefit is. Modest effects on lung function that are inconsistent, modest effects on quality of life. Yet these are the two measures that traditionally we've used to assess drug efficacy in aspirin COPD. So you have to flip a bit to, to focus on exacerbations to, to be able to measure the benefits of these drugs. Interestingly, there is a documented mortality benefit in diffuse panbronchiolitis. Um, has it yet been shown in other obstructive lung diseases. So back to exacerbations. So here's two graphs looking at the time course of exacerbations. The top is days, uh, days to weeks, and the bottom is years. So you could give macrolides for acute exacerbations of asthma and COPD. Uh, two studies have done that for asthma. Telecast study was positive with telithromycin. The azalea study was negative for azithromycin. So it's a bit unclear whether there's a role in acute exacerbations. Protracted exacerbations are another beast that, and so what that refers to is someone getting an exacerbation but not being the same for weeks and months afterwards. I suspect many of us saw these patients after last year's flu epidemic coming along. Um, what do you do? What do you do for them? Uh, I actually found macrolides useful. This is a pretty much therapeutically, this is an evidence-free zone. But there's a lovely paper by Sean Aron studying this phenomenon in the East London cohort, so studying protracted COPD exacerbations. I think it's a fruitful area for research could be difficult because their, their frequency is, is uh, dependent a bit on having epidemic exacerbation years. But really the benefit is around frequency of exacerbations over several years. So that's what I'm going to look at, uh, the use of macrolides, long-term low-dose use. Uh, and the issues are, do they work? How do they work? Is there a group who are respond better? What are the side effects? And how do you give them? And that is which drug? How often? How long? And could you give it episodically? So these are the things I'm going to try and address with uh, in asthma and COPD. Uh, so to answer efficacy of macrolides in COPD, there's a nice systematic review 
published in PLOS One in 2015. So they looked at patients receiving any oral macrolide for greater than three months. Uh, they found nine RCTs of about 1,600 odd patients. One, one study with clarithromycin, three with erythromycin, five with azithromycin. Uh, an important thing in all of these studies is what's the background therapy? Were they receiving what's considered to be optimal background airway disease treatment? And in three of the studies, there was at least a reasonable proportion of the patients were getting ICS larva and llamas. So this is the forest plot showing uh, the efficacy of macrolides in COPD. And you can see that on average, there's a 42% reduction in exacerbation rate. So that's a clinically important effect. It's double the effects we're hearing about with a bronchodilators and triple therapy. So it's uh, important and in some cases it's in addition to uh, inhaled therapy. In other cases not all the, the patients received optimal inhaled therapy. What about asthma? So there are two studies that have looked at exacerbations with uh, macrolides in asthma. Both of them used azithromycin so this is the Azizar study from Belgium. The patients in this study had moderate to severe asthma on ICS larva. They had frequent exacerbations in the previous year and also episodes of infective bronchitis. And they tried to pick out a non-eosinophilic group by selecting people who had low pheno. Uh, the primary outcome was negative. So on your left, that graph shows no effect of azithromycin in the, the total, subgroup, total group of asthma patients. When they broke them down into eosinophilic and non-eosinophilic asthma, and they did that by a blood eosinophil count of 0 0.2 or 200 cells, they saw a benefit of uh, azithromycin reducing exacerbations in non-eosinophilic asthma. Uh, the next study is a study that we published last year. So this is an important, I think it's a definitive asthma azithromycin study because I'm biased. Uh, but it's also a great achievement for Australian research. It's NHMRC funded and you'll see the stellar names on the author list who are probably sitting next to you. Uh, and we, we all managed to keep talking to each other before, during and after the study. Maybe that was the biggest result. Anyway, these were adults with persistent asthma on fixed dose maintenance therapy. They were treated with add-on azithromycin, 500 milligrams, three times a week for 48 weeks, compared to identical placebo. Uh, the primary outcomes, asthma exacerbations and quality of life, and it was a double-blind randomized trial. So if you just perhaps focus on the text, because the, the flow chart's a little bit hard to read, but we, uh, we screened 500 odd people, randomised 420. Um, they had to be stable for four weeks, current non-smokers. We excluded people who had substantial parenchymal lung disease, uh, hearing impairment or abnormal QT prolongation. And they visited eight, on eight times uh, to the clinic over the study period and had phone contacts in between times. We had a similar number of dropouts in both placebo and azithromycin of about 40 odd people. <clears throat> and the study was analyzed as intention to treat. So this was an older population of asthmatics. It's a median age of 60 years. They'd had long standing asthma. Uh, they were atopic. 38% were ex-smokers, and you can see they, most of them, 86% were on high-dose ICS. All were on a long-acting bronchodilator. They had poor asthma control, airflow obstruction, and about 43% had eosinophilic asthma. And the corresponding number had non-eosinophilic asthma. This is the uh, primary outcome slide. 
And I think the most important graph is the bottom left. That's the raw data. So that shows the exacerbation rate in placebo, which is pink, compared to azithromycin, which is blue, uh, over the course of 48 weeks. So quite a significant reduction. On average, there's a 40% reduction in exacerbation rate from 1.87 per patient per year to 1.07 exacerbations per patient per year. The graph on the bottom right is the time to exacerbation, which is also significant. And what you can see there is the gap there is not as big as the raw data gap. That is, the effect doesn't seem to be as big. And this, in this graph, it's, if someone, once you have an exacerbation, you're excluded from further analysis, whereas the other graph includes all exacerbations. So what we interpret that to mean is that there's a appears to be a bigger effect in those patients that have frequent exacerbations, which would be excluded from the right-hand graph. So it reduces exacerbations, particularly in frequent exacerbators. What about the target population? Can you pick out a group who might, might do better? So we had a go at this, and the COPD, large COPD studies have had a go at this. And the short answer is there are some clues, but it doesn't really apply that well um, when you try and apply it to individual patients. Um, if we start at the bottom, so the biggest effect we saw was in those patients that had colonization with a pathogenic bacteria, Haemophilus, Strep, Staph, Pseudomonas. But even if you were bacteria negative, you still got an effect. What about cough and sputum, so the more bronchitic flavour of asthma? Yes, a cough VAS we used to sort of pick that group out. Yes, they responded, but that didn't predict response any better than people without that phenotype. Similarly, frequent exacerbations had a big effect, but, you, but still infrequent exacerbators responded. And up the top is a good example of why we do randomised trials. Uh, our, we believe that this treatment would work in non-eosinophilic asthma and not work in eosinophilic asthma. And you would have heard me uh, give a talk or two on that hypothesis, <laughs> including a pilot study which su supported that. But look what we found. We found that, yes, it did work in non-eosinophilic asthma, just like the Azizar study, but it worked even better in eosinophilic asthma. And I said, oh, that's strange. And uh, people said, you, you should count your blessings, mate. Uh, what about side effects? So side effects of macrolides. Uh, ototoxicity is recognized. Um, it seems to be a particular problem in people with pre-existing uh, hearing loss or using high-dose treatment. It wasn't a problem in the uh, azithromycin study that we did. Uh, there was some signal in this Albert study using azithromycin in COPD at higher doses. Hepatic toxicity. Uh, we spent a lot of money on liver function tests uh, and saw no evidence of hepatic toxicity, which doesn't seem to be a clinically important thing with azithromycin. However, could be important with some of the erythromycin compounds. Uh, diarrhea, so macrolides stimulate motilin receptors, uh, and certainly uh, we saw some diarrhea signals in, in our uh, group of patients. How did we address this? So we had a set of rules to minimise risk of toxicity. So QTC prolongation, we had a cutoff of 480. That's higher than uh, many uh, other sort of earlier studies or higher than your clinical pharmacist will tell you, but there's, a, there's probably an overreaction to QTC problems and 480 is where people are now settling in for industry trials as well. There's an important interaction with statins. Uh, statins are sub, some statins are substrates for a particular cytochrome P450 enzyme. If you inhibit that enzyme with a macrolide, then the patient is at risk of quite a nasty rhabdomyolysis. 
we manage that by swapping people to a statin that's not a substrate for that CP450 enzyme. So we swap them to rosuvastatin. And uh, we used a macrolide, which at the time we thought was less likely, but now people say doesn't inhibit, and that which is azithromycin. If you're not doing that, so if you're using erythro or clarithro, then you need to be much more active managing the statin interaction. So for safety, we recorded a number of pre-specified events plus any adverse event. We put a lot of attention on infections. So we asked our patients about to report any clinically infectious episode anywhere. You didn't have to have it proven by microbiology. We wanted to capture this idea that you'll induce resistance and people will get infected with resistant organisms. So any infection. We also looked at sputum pathogens and we did surveillance cultures to look for uh, sort of commensal resistance development. And we're in the process of studying the microbiome changes and the resistome. So that is the resist antibiotic resistance genes that you can pull out of microbiome studies. Uh, we found fewer infections in the azithromycin treated group. So the, uh, this idea that the long-term antibiotics will cause more infections, that was no signal there. In fact, it was the opposite for respiratory infections, fewer respiratory infections. The patients had more diarrhea, 33% uh, complained of diarrhea. We managed that by dose modification and there wasn't a greater withdrawal from the azithromycin or placebo group. We didn't have problems with hearing loss or QTC prolongation and I, I told you about the infection of, uh, observation. What about bacteriology? So num the, the uh, answer here is the last line on the slide, but just to go through it, this is looking at pathogens and anti azithromycin resistant pathogens at baseline and after treatment. So those pathogens are Haemophilus, Pseudomonas, Staph, Strep, gram-negative rods, the things that will be reported on a sputum culture. We didn't find a statistically significant uh, increase in resistance. But we did find, if you look at the last line, the azithromycin group, at baseline, they had a 30% resistance rate in their pathogens, and that was doubled at the end of treatment to 60%. So that's likely to be clinically important, or even though it's not statistically significant. So uh, the antibiotic resistance does develop, but it doesn't appear to be universal in, in our experience with this, and doesn't appear to translate into clinical infections, but nonetheless, it occurs. We also did surveillance cultures to look at um, any, bu any bug, so we looked at non-pathogens, ask them to report on non-pathogens <coughs> in the sputum, nose and throat for azithromycin resistance. And you can see that it increased with azithromycin, particularly in the sputum. So I think this is a, an area where we, you would need to c continue to observe what's the importance and significance of, of these results. So the summary of the efficacy and safety is that uh, in asthma and COPD, a year of azithromycin is effective uh, with some side effects, but they, they can be managed. So what, let's have a think about dosing now. So this is, a, I think, probably the clinically important question. Which drug, azithromycin or erythromycin? So this is the COPD meta-analysis. The azithromycin studies are in a blue box. The erythromycin studies are in a red circle. And if you sort of look at the effect size of the red circles and the blue boxes, there's not much in it. And so the, 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 these authors concluded that there was no efficacy difference between azithromycin and erythromycin in this use, its use in COPD. Why did we use azithromycin in asthma? Uh, it had a longer half-life, so we felt it would sort out non-adherence. 
Uh, you didn't have to dose as often. Uh, it, and I've, it has a less symptomatic side effect profile than erythromycin. I also didn't want to get to the end of the study and if the study be, use erythromycin, the study's negative and someone said, oh, you used the wrong drug. So that was why we chose azithromycin. In asthma, there aren't any uh, erythromycin RCTs. So really, I think there isn't a reason to choose one over the other based on efficacy. The reasons would come down to safety and ease of access to, for, uh, for the drug. And GI symptoms and drug interactions, uh, so GI symptoms are probably worse with erythro. Drug interactions may or may not be worse, but can be managed with both. Microbial resistance for an individual's about the same, and, but it's believed that community microbial resistance is worse with azithromycin. So there are the things that you, you may use to, in choosing one or the other. What about duration of therapy? I think this is an interesting one. Um, in the COPD meta-analysis, the studies that were less than three months were not significantly uh, positive. So they were, it appeared to be ineffective, less than three months. Here's the two asthma studies with a blue line drawn at three months. And you can see on the left, the Azizar study, the effect is not starting to be apparent at three months. So they're only seeing an effect after three months. And in our study, the magnitude of effect is greater for the last nine months than it is for the first three months. So it might be, uh, so I sort of take from this, you probably need to go a minimum of three months uh, in order to assess an effect on exacerbations when you use that as the outcome. Uh, now, this is a bit of fun. What about seasonal treatment? So could you just use it in winter? Would it just work in winter? You reckon, yeah? Yeah, so this apparently is pretty popular uh, in the UK. Here we have the AMAZES data by the months of the year. The number of exacerbations in the placebo group, which is the open bars, and the azithromycin group, which is the closed bars, the black bars. So what time of year would you pick if you're gonna use it episodically? So if you subtract one from the other, and so this is the difference, so the bigger the number, the better the effect, and put it over the seasons. I don't think the winter hypothesis holds up here, because uh, in spring there appears to be equally in effect. But of course, these are the European seasons, and we've only had them in Australia since 1788. Prior to that, we didn't have these seasons. And Tim Entwistle, who's the uh, guy that runs the Royal Botanical Gardens in Melbourne, he's proposed a different set of seasons, sprinter and sprummer. <laughs> and he came up with this idea. He worked in the Royal Gardens in Kew for a while. Then he, then he worked in Melbourne. And he said, the plants don't behave the same way. On the 1st of September is not the day that plants start flowering. They flower a month or so before that. So he, he thinks uh, we are better served by having five or six seasons. Uh, and he calls the additional ones sprinter, which is a combination of spring and winter, and sprummer, a combination of spring and summer. Now, Adelaide of Hubertus, I think, might have different seasons again. So what we've done is just analysed our data for the east coast of Australia uh, to see whether sprinter and sprummer, seasonal treatment in sprinter and sprummer will be effective. Who's, gonna, who's prepared to vote? Will it, be, will it work? He's, James is shaking his head. No, he reckons, yeah, good. Thank you. <laughs> There's the answer. I think it says that winter, there's not enough here to say just winter alone, and my, sprinter maybe. Another way, you could flip it on its head and say you probably don't, if you are gonna use it episodically, you probably don't need it in summer. 
but the rest of the year uh, you do. Okay. So my summary then is that uh, in adults with obstructive lung disease, asthma or COPD, and ongoing symptoms and exacerbations, who are on long-acting bronchodilators, and if indicated, on inhaled steroids, and you screen them for QT prolongation, cardiac arrhythmias, and significant hearing loss, and if you give low-dose long-term azithromycin for up to 12 months, you'll uh, reduce exacerbations by 40%. And before jumping into it, you just need to think to yourself, uh, okay, what's the QT? Particularly if it's non-eosinophilic disease, have I ruled out non-tuberculous mycobacteria? 